Hey everyone, welcome to episode 42. My name is Keisha and I'm the producer. Today's episode is with Pat Lennox, who is a CPA CA based in Calgary, Alberta. He's a world traveler, backcountry camper, and a corporate finance professional with experience in M&A, assurance, and more. And he joined Sam to discuss his life as an entrepreneur, how to deal with uncertainty as an entrepreneur and becoming one from working a regular job to then not, and also how to do what you enjoy while also working really, really hard. Uh, it's a great episode if you have any entrepreneurial ambitions, and also maybe if you're just an outdoorsy person or feel like maybe you are a CPA or a wannabe CPA, uh, with a little bit of a different style from most out there. So uh, with that said, enjoy. Hello, Pat Lennox. Hi, Sham. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, this is exciting, exciting. And we start off with a hard hitting question. And the question for you today is, what is your favorite flavor of Gatorade? Oh, favorite flavor of Gatorade. Is is this somehow related to the fact that I've been going to the Calgary Stampede? <laughs> I mean, if you want to out yourself, absolutely. Yeah. Were you able to drink your favorite flavor of uh, Gatorade this morning? I was. Um, my favorite flavor is orange. and um, But it has to be mixed with water because I'm an old person now. I was going to ask. It was like straight up or like mixed? Yeah. Mixed. Has to be mixed um yeah very watered down just a hint of flavor um but yeah that uh that is helping me through the calgary stampede gauntlet um uh, which concluded yesterday for me so now i can come back to real life love it i know when i <laughs> had some scheduling issues and asked you to push this back and you agreed and then said by the way it's during stampede i was like you are a boss and thank you well fortunately most of what I've been doing at Stampede is work-related. We're um, out there with the small firm I work with, essentially throwing business cards at anyone with a pulse. Um, so a lot of it was work. Um, and, and what time did this work start at? Uh, it has been starting at 11 a.m. and okay. uh, wrapping up around late in the p.m., sometimes wrapping around to the a.m., so... <laughs> You're a hard worker, Pat. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm willing to put in the hours, you know. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, this should be interesting. Looking looking forward to this. Um, how do we know each other? Did we meet at one of these? <laughs> one of these oh workers? man, we we might have and then not even remember. <laughs> yeah, not even and, known uh, it. And then cross paths again with the National Marketing Center. Uh Oh, geez. Four years ago now, I believe. So yeah, even even go back like a little bit before then, because how how did we know to kind of meet up for the National Marketing Center? Right. So back to see Pasby and I was I was running one of the discussion boards in the mm -hmm. finance mod, which I think that's what got us kind of emailing back and forth. And um yeah, the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah, and it's really cool because you're one of the people, there's been a few others out there, but you're one of the people that I saw your work before I saw you on the discussion board. So Nikki and I, um, we were hosting a facilitator training session and we were talking about it and she was like, look at this facilitator's um, like QC tracker or something that you had put together. So your spreadsheet, I, I was well aware of the famous Pat and his spreadsheets. Uh, and then oh, I God. saw your work on the discussion boards. Oh yeah. We reached out to you and we said, Hey, can we use your spreadsheet, your intellectual property? Can we share it to make other people, your competition more efficient? And you said. Absolutely. Amazing. <laughs> I, cause it's, it's a team thing, right? It's if, if I'm able to share stuff that makes us all stronger and makes us all more efficient, then it just makes life easier for everyone who's involved in running the modules and conversely student experience should get better as well. I agree. Uh, I will say that that is not a sentiment that everybody shares. So it speaks to your character. And so it was like double cool. It was like, this guy does good work and he's cool about sharing it. And then when your name came up like six months later on the discussion board um, where I was lead policy and you were doing the content, I was like, oh, that spreadsheet guy. And yeah. then when I said yes to take on the National Marketing Center, I was like, I need a finance guru. And <laughs> like, I like that. He has good spreadsheets. Let's have a call. And that's when I connected 
with you and oh my gosh what good fortune uh caitlin in japan yeah yeah we got up at um i think it was 4 a.m oh. our time we were on and i think that was like i don't know 6 p.m your time or something crazy yeah I mean, um, <laughs> we made it work. oh yeah and it was no that was great and it, it got us rolling and um i just love that i'm spreadsheet guy uh Oh my gosh, you were a spreadsheet guy and that like that hasn't left you because during the time at the National Marketing Center, like, yes, you can and you did do a wonderful job leading um, and working with the technical side of accounting as well as like the people management and, you know, because you're a little bit cheerleader, a little bit principal, a little bit like, you know, you're, you're, you have to be such a dynamic person in, in order to lead a team of over a hundred CPAs uh, in order to evaluate uh, with quality feedback of 7,000 candidates um, cases in a matter of what, like 96 hours? Like it's not easy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a sprint. And, and then, then, and then when we had <laughs> issues um, and I needed, I, I, I asked you to take on two of these overlapping and you said, yes. <laughs> I don't know how I managed that. Um, Maybe it was a lot of spreadsheets and analytics that helped support me because it it was crazy. Um, great experience. Um, good to test the limits, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Don't know if I could ever do it again. No, and um, and nobody should have to. And yeah. the fact that it got that far is is definitely a black mark on on me. But I'm I'm just oh. very fortunate that we have a good team, right? And you just yeah. well, and actually have that happen, you, but when it does, yeah. Yeah, these emergencies come up and you people scramble and find a way to get it done right and um then we did just that we did and i, I feel yeah. like throughout yeah. all of this like one, one of the reasons why i'm so excited to have you on here is like yeah you're a spreadsheet guy um but you're you have to have a solid skill set and develop a solid skill set in order and something that you're interested in but then like the magic is when you can take that skill set and communicate and be a good team player and be you know, just somebody who, who gets shit done and is enjoyable to be around and wants to lift up other people. So what I hope some students take out of this is just like an element of like, fuck yeah, I want to do a bit of that. And that's how I'm going to relate to like, you know, successful career for myself while bringing up other people. So that's, um, and I'm really looking forward to unpacking your story. Uh, and so let's, let's go backwards to come back forwards. Um, sure. And you are a CPA, CA, which means that you are firm trained and uh, I don't want to say old school, but you're not from the new school. So uh, you, you're like myself and Caitlin did, did both. Um, what was your path to becoming a designated accountant? So I didn't know I wanted to be an accountant um, until fairly late. Um, so went to university um, and wanted to go into business. So doing my business thing, taking all those first year classes and kind of like, Oh, this accounting stuff seems very useful. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm an accounting type stereotypically, especially at the time. Um, but I wanted to get that technical understanding of business and have, have something quantitative and something where I can build a, a skill set around that. So um, accounting felt like, the right move. Um, and even in the back of my mind at the time, I was thinking, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I don't feel like I'm the type of person who's going to wind up being, you know, a partner at a firm or something like that, um, particularly within assurance and not saying anything bad about assurance, of course, but um, we're all different makes and molds. And um, so anyways, um, went through university, got a co-op term with a uh, big four firm. Um, and that progressed into full-time employment there and went through, did my articling at that firm and got my letters. And that's where my little finance brain started going and saying, well, I like a lot of this finance stuff. Um, so happy to have the framework and the knowledge um, of, of doing my CA designation because um, for what I do now, which I'll ramble on about in a little bit, I guess, but having a solid accounting understanding and solid fundamentals for all the crazy stuff I do now, um, it makes me so much stronger. Um, 
So I'm, I'm truly a much more useful financial professional in so many ways um, for having that, uh, that accounting experience. Could you give us like just one solid example of how you use um, accounting um, either in your current gig or kind of when you kind of were taking more of that finance direction and you were like dug into a toolbox and was like, boom, accounting skill. Um, yeah, so so I, I wound up in FP&A, um, financial planning financial. and analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was I was essentially day in, day out running the model um, for this industry company I was at. And we were doing dividend reinvestment plans, um, trying to preserve dividends through some tough years, some acquisitions, um, some sales and leasebacks. And like the list just goes on of all these things where then our executive team and VP finance would come to me and say, Hey, we need, we're going to do this crazy thing. How does that look? And okay, go. And so for me, it would be, okay, I know exactly accounting wise, what would our journal entries be to do this, for example, and then just flow that into this model. That's now projecting things out always on a basically a five-year timeline. So Love it. Be, able to, be able to take the accounting impact and then flow it into this, this forward-looking tool that, that we use to make these, these big decisions every day. Perfect. Because I remember being in our consolidations class and like I said, this love and kindness, but I had a student have a mini freak out being like, why did they just buy a hundred percent of the company? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like, <laughs> um, well, you know, you have this thing called strategy and I'm like, maybe the owner wouldn't sell a hundred percent. Maybe they didn't have enough money to buy a hundred percent. Maybe they didn't want to buy a hundred percent. Like, and so I talked about strategy and then they kind of went off a little bit more like this is this is in strategy class. Like we want to just learn accounting. And like, this is a very slow burn. Like I'm over dramatizing it, but I'm like, listen, what like yes you can know this and you can be a reactive accountant and there's a role for that and that's fine but you can also be a strategic accountant and have a seat at the table and project out and build your career uh almost like you're so good that you can't be ignored like people were coming to you you know very senior level executives being like hey pat like how like how does this impact this right like what, what are we doing here and you're like absolutely i can speak both languages and i'm happy to do so absolutely yeah yeah so going back, you're at the firm. What was your first role kind of outside of the firm or outside of audit? I don't know if you, did you have any transitions within the firm? Uh, I did a little bit. I did uh, some short secondments in tax, um, mainly just during tax season when we need people to crank out returns. And I was more than happy to do it because of course needed tax hours to get my, my letters. So um, so within the firm, um, a little bit of tax, but it was it was primarily all audit. Um, but we were going through a time when impairment tests were just like under IFRS where there were some new changes, right? So it felt like I did impairment tests all the time. So I was always looking at my clients models and that I think is what also helped kind of push me into that fp a role. So um, yeah, because in, in the impairment testing, you're kind of looking at the cash flows, projecting out the cash flows and then discounting them back and being like, hey, company, are you are you doing OK? Are, are we exactly. going to have to give you a big write down? <laughs> yeah. And oh, you recommended some write downs at times. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so so I got to see all these models and um, it paired up nicely with uh, also my experience going through CASB, the legacy program. Um, I, I only got distinction on one exam, uh, but that was mod four. If you remember back to what that used to be like, and it was essentially all finance and building out forecasts and things. And so I was like, well, I did pretty well here. I'm liking this stuff. Maybe I should be thinking about fp &A and some of the more financey things. So, um, yeah, that led me out to industry, um, uh, started as a, as a financial analyst um, on this team. And then uh, my career kind of through with that company, I, I wound up as uh, the manager of fp &A and had a team of five or six reporting to me, building all our models and, and all that stuff. And so more that was about <laughs> more spreadsheets. We were, we were team spreadsheet. And, um, but that was my, that was my first experience after, after leaving the firm. Cool. So we, for those um, that 
didn't listen to the Caitlin podcast, I recommend going back and listening to, uh, to that episode because we'll get a little bit more into kind of the precipitous, like the, you know, what lead up, led up to kind of leaving the jobs and going to travel. But I kind of want to dig into your story about that um, in a way that brings us up to what you're doing now. So were you at that company where you had the team of five before leaving for the, the world traveling? Or was there another role in there? Uh, yeah, I left um, from that company. So um, I'm sure Caitlin, to your point, uh, shared a lot of the story. Um, on my side of it, yeah, one, let's of the, hear, yeah. one, one of the biggest things was, so at my my time in university, I passed up an opportunity to go do a semester abroad so I could do all my courses to get me to CASB sooner. Um, so that's that was one strike of passing up travel opportunities. Then my time at the firm, a lot of my friends stayed longer than I did. They went to Australia, England, Singapore, like doing, you know, secondments for six months to multiple years. I left. So again, there's, there's another strike where I'm like, I love traveling, missed, you know, forced myself out of another opportunity. So after about five years of, um, of working with that FP&A team um, and having a great experience, learning a lot, um, but also um, really feeling like, well, this three weeks a year of vacation time isn't quite going to make it feasible to go do some of this traveling that we want to do. So um, we came up with the idea while we were, and we being me and Caitlin, um, while we were facilitating for CPASB, we said, hey, like we can do this from anywhere. And we're both kind of entrepreneurial anyways and comfortable, maybe not knowing exactly where the next paycheck's coming from, um, if we're going to keep getting offers as facilitators, et cetera. So, but we said, Hey, like, let's, let's try this. Um, if, if we don't do this soon, we're not going to do it. So, um, so yeah, we, we both left, left our jobs and, um, we were world traveling facilitators for better part of a year. Uh, and, and yeah, like, wouldn't uh wouldn't change that experience for anything it was um it was absolutely um, the right choice to make and the right move uh scary but also um you know you push yourself out of your comfort zone um you typically find you you're better off for it yeah um and did you did you have any consulting clients other than cpa west and then the nmc when we met up did you have or like what did you do with the relationships of the jobs that you left behind like how did you kind of manage all of that to almost set yourself up for re-entry when you came back so it was it was a lot of uncertainty yeah. it was a lot of ongoing conversations though which was interesting and it has actually led me to a lot of the stuff going on right now that's oh. keeping me busy. Okay. Um, so the probably the best example is um, one of my friends from Deloitte who um, went off and started his own firm that does uh, you know a lot of different accounting services, um, but is also does uh, placements and referrals and things like that. So I emailed him, said, "Hey, I'm leaving my current job. I'm going traveling for a while, but I'm I'm essentially." open to consulting work and he said well I know a guy who might need some models built uh might need spreadsheet guy yeah. um and I was like okay cool like if I can go be on a beach somewhere and I'm just picking away at a model uh and make a few <laughs> extra bucks while we travel that's wonderful um but it's things tend to be long runways at times yes. right so yes um did our whole trip without actually hearing from this guy, which was fine because we had our little plan anyways, facilitating wise, and was talking to various other people, just relationships that I have where you don't know what kind of opportunity is going to come up when. So just truly staying in touch with all these connections, um, wind up getting home. And uh, two days after I got home, one of my connections uh, said, Hey, we've got this, We've got this charity that, that we work for and we've never had an accountant before. We've had people try to do the accounting. We need someone to build the accounting function on a part-time basis because they're small. Um, but if you're passionate about the mission and all that stuff, then it might be a good fit. And so I said, yeah, let's, let's do that. Then I can start fitting that in. Um, then of course, some of the NMC stuff with you um, through our ongoing relationship and discussions that gets rolling. And then 
probably after being home for a good six, eight months, guy who needs models gives me a shout. And we, so it's been at this point, you know, almost two years since, you know, we were first mentioned to each other. Um, but fast forward all of that, that is now the thing keeping me um, the busiest. So when I was talking about going out, throwing business cards at people during Stampede, um, that was him and I with this firm that he founded uh, now coming up on two years ago. Um, and it's a, it's a corporate finance um, M&A advisory shop. And we've, um, we've got two deals in the market right now. We've completed a handful of deals together over the last year and a half. Um, so yeah, long story short. No, um, that's so cool. That is so, 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 so cool. Yeah. It's, um, and it, it was just one of those things of there's kind of right time, right place and let things kind of ripen. And, um, you never know when that one conversation is going to turn into that next opportunity. And, um, so, and with this firm, there's only, there's only three of us really full timing it. Um, I'm the guy who builds all the models. Um, we've got another guy who's, uh, you know, I banker for 25 years. So he's specializes in all our banking deals. Um, and then the main guy, the principal, uh, he's, he's got experience everywhere. I banker by trade as well. So, um, so really I'm essentially what happened with all of this is I'm, I am a CA, but I'm an accountant, but I masquerade kind of as an entrepreneur and as a, as a essentially small time investment banker now. And, um, it's all been culmination of all that previous experience coming together. Super cool. Cause we get a lot of super cool for all the reasons. And one that I can think of off the top of my head for our students is we often, you know, have the, have students say, I really like numbers. I really like business. I'm stuck between accounting and finance. And my advice is always like, do both. Like, don't, don't yeah. limit yourself. Like, do one and then a little bit of the other or do both at the same time, you know, um, or do, do one um, and then see if you still want to do that. Like, just, just do it. Like, yes, the answer is yes. Um, build the skill set, be a good human, um, develop those relationships. Yeah. Like, and I really like how you said, did you say let it marinate? Because I really like that. Yeah. Like let it, no need to like rush. You have your plan A, you have your plan B. You could have, you know, pulled some other levers or like, you know, made some other relationships, but like, yeah, like you're, I feel like sometimes like we've all, have you ever been to the States and like gone to a mall? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's another experience. I'm like walking down the middle of the mall and somebody like, like it's like they like throw something in your chest and then like all of a sudden you're holding it and they're like now that you're holding my product like let me like put it on you and you're just like yeah. what is going on so like you know we're, we're Canadian we want to work with people we want to be helpful but you don't want to like throw this stuff at them absolutely yeah um I someone like I love analogies and somebody I was working with the other day said it was something like every flower blooms in its own wow. time right and it's like you never know when that maybe it's something that's it's not going to come around every year you have to wait a little longer but it's um to your point like we're sometimes we expect things to be so immediate and so right now um the right kind of opportunities that are going to fit for what we want um sometimes just to a little bit of patience can um can make sure the right thing uh does come along eventually uh because i i've certainly had times when i'm trying to be this weird entrepreneurial uh, ca that i'm like is, is this what i should be doing like you know you, you dealt yourself at times and look at some of my friends who just have the steady eddie you know whatever their career is but yeah. very predictable position very defined hours and um it's that would be nice but I would get bored extremely quickly. Um, it would be nice to... because correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's like predictable. It feels normal or what's the accepted norm. But like you just said, it, it wouldn't feel good for you. Exactly. I, I need, I need a little bit of that um, competitive element and there's, there's gotta be, you know, I'm much more of a project based person where, we're doing this thing, we're building it, we're doing whatever, we're working on a deal. And there's a point where you can say if you want or not. And that, yeah. 
that's I'm just a competitive person. So I think I need that in what I do day to day. Uh, and it just, it really helps me stay engaged and, and do my best work. Generous and competitive. I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I hear that. Um, I, you know, I aspire to be that as well. Okay. So I want to know what advice you would have to management learners, possibly accounting or finance management learners who want to take on a little bit more of that uncertainty, but don't know if they can manage it or they want tips on how to manage it. So can I ask you what your advice to management learners would be to, you know, deal with that uncertainty? Oh, that's such a, such a good question, Sam, because I, I didn't know how to start, right? I started my career was okay, I work here. This is my job. I have one stream of income and it takes a lot of time. How do I start diversifying? How do I go into some of that uncertainty and try different things? Um, and I, this kind of dovetails, I think, into you're going to maybe ask me about podcasts and books later, but um, I through a podcast I listened to, um, it exposed me to this book called The 10% Entrepreneur. Mm. So you you tend to think of people doing the startup thing as it has to be their whole thing and they're taking all this risk and it's just, you're all in. And you're, a lot of us look at it that and say, and myself included, like, oh, I can't, I can't give up my paycheck for years and hope this one thing is successful. Um, but essentially the message in that book was if you're willing to have a side hustle or a few extra hours a week, whatever it may be, start looking for opportunities like that and scratch that entrepreneurial itch on the side while you're yeah. still, especially early in your career, you're, you know, you're just trying to pay rent and afford the mac and cheese and ramen that you're eating and stuff. Uh, you oh, know? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know about you, but like my energy in my twenties was like, yeah, yeah, like I got this. And so it's like harness that because yeah. like my energy is still high, but it's different. So like harness that energy and harness the skill set and get paid to yeah. learn things. Cause essentially that's what the yeah. 10% entrepreneur could be is being paid to pick up more skill sets. Absolutely. And, and you never know when just, you know, dipping your toes in, in that water in one way or another might bring forward another opportunity. Right. And then it, it can start snowballing for you. And if, if you're the type of person who's comfortable trying to pick up your own clients and not having that level of certainty, say six months down the road, um, it's a, it's a great way to start exposing yourself to it, especially when you're, you know, late in university, early in your career. Um, like another thing that I've seen uh, somewhat more recently when we're looking for junior analysts who can help us with even just building out pro formas or, you know, small little quick project things is um, a lot of students who are near the end of their, uh, their degree who are trying to pick up little jobs like that on the side. Um, nice. So that, and, and you'd be surprised for all the students out there, how much of a need there is on short-term basis for firms like the one I work for, where we're pressed for time. We're trying to get a deal done. And we're like, we need somebody to do a day of research and, none of us have the time boy it'd be great if we could short-term hire somebody who's junior who's like you said who's looking to get paid to learn um there's opportunities out there uh, it's a matter of um making yourself available and, and seeing who will pay you to learn yeah and having this connection so that when the short-term need does come up they know to reach out to you um versus like hey what do you have right now it's like no just like go out Keshav's interview is great um, that we did because he worked in like and also made relationships with the people that he worked with or the people that worked with people that he worked with and just made relationships so that, you know, um, I don't know what his intent is, but I, I know that I, an intent if somebody was curious about making their own way is like, you put yourself out there and then they know, Hey, maybe I'll reach out to this person that I met. Oh, this person is keen to learn this. Oh, that's great. Because yeah, Pat, like you and I have both been there where you're just like, Oh my gosh, we have more work than we have hours. I wish like, who can I think of that would be a, have the skill set possibly, but B wants to be there and will like make yeah. it work and who will, you know, pull an all nighter to come through for the team, which is to me more important than the skill set. Absolutely. Um, you can, 
you can develop skill sets. Um, it's a lot harder to teach work ethic or change someone's work ethic and willingness to grind if you have to grind, right? Um, and and it doesn't always have to be the all nighter either. Hopefully, yeah. you know, if um, if if it's the right thing, it can be very manageable hours. We hope usually, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> we always hope so. And then we hope so. <laughs> but, we... Not, but I feel. I, <laughs> I feel like our superpower is like we plan and plan and we, you know, are pragmatic, but sometimes you just, you have to pull that lever. Yeah. Sometimes brute force is just the only way to get through it. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Uh, I want to throw something out there um, yeah. and see if you agree or disagree. But when we look at companies and we analyze their financial statements, if one company had a single source of revenue, we would call that risky. Correct or incorrect? I love this, Sam. Yes, that, absolutely. <laughs> and yet, when we see a company who maybe they don't have steady uh, increasing revenues year over year, but they have multiple streams of income, and sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but at least they have multiple streams of, of revenue. What do we tend to think about those companies? They're diversified. They're more stable. They're safer. Um, they, can, they can weather a shock, right? that like you said one stream might be down one year but they've there's enough enough eggs in the basket that um you know they're they're rarely going to be in in serious trouble uh with all their different streams at the same time yeah so why is it then that we tend to feel like um the narrative out there at least for accountants um that i seem to see and seems to be uh, commonly accepted within our business school and really within our profession is that one job is the best thing and you should go to X job and work up and in five years make manager and in blah, blah, blah years make VP and blah, 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 make blah, blah, blah and da, da, da. But yet to me, that is so risky because, and maybe that involves a company change or two, but it's still a single source of income and it relies on a bunch of factors outside of your control. It relies on market conditions. Is there going to be a need? It relies on, you know, political influence. Like the best power, in my opinion, is opportunity cost, is to have a lot of, you know, if you have to turn something down because you have sli something slightly better, it might feel like garbage, but that's amazing because it means you have options and you've diversified your personal revenue. Oh, absolutely. Like you're, you're speaking my language right now, all the way. Um, and that was, that was something I was telling myself when I was trying to break out from the one job into the multiple different streams was I'm a business, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm not just an employee. I'm, if I want to be a business, I can be a business. And it's at the point now where I actually, I'm incorporated. I have my own professional corporation because I, I hit the point I needed that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's such a good way to insulate your earnings um, to have these different multiple streams coming in. And even if it's just two, um, yeah, it's, it's something extra over your regular day job. Even if you're one of the people who wants to focus and there's a lot of us who focus on, I have my career at such and such firm, such and such company. Like it's not a bad thing, but man, is it ever safe and, and helpful if you've got just one other little piece coming in. Yeah. And for those people that maybe don't feel comfortable taking on uh, more work or consulting at or something, I would encourage to then diversify with a volunteer gig because yeah. there's going to be learning there. There's going to be likely be mentorship and Honestly, like the people that when you are surrounded by a community of your people working towards a common objective, um, you can, you know, accomplish some really cool things, develop your accounting skill set, develop other skill sets, and that might lead to other work. And that's another way of at least diversifying your network. Um, and then, yeah, it's just like looking at it strategically, which we don't always do personally. And I will say I did freak out my first batch of students. The first year do you want to do you want to hear something embarrassing absolutely yes <laughs> I asked them to define what job security was after like, this is like my last class so like your last class of the semester and I was going to see them again the next semester fourth year intermediate financial accounting two uh the technical is done we're doing a bit of review and then it was like the chit chatty part and I asked them to define what job security was 
So <laughs> they were like, it's when you get a, a T4 job. It's when you, uh, it's when your employer pays you enough money that you can make rent and you know go for dinner a few times. And like these are all really good answers. And like they they were all really like better answers than I would ever give when I was fourth year like a student. I would have been like, I don't know, like <laughs> right? Like what would you have said as a fourth year student? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like probably like, I don't know. I have, I have an employment contract of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> I've signed something that says somebody will pay me to do a job. <laughs> yeah. Like that's job security. Um, yeah. And unfortunately um, for those students, my dad um, had been offered essentially to either be laid off um, a one-year package or a demotion and 10% decrease to his salary after being with the same company for over 25 years. Um, and so I was, I was definitely like a little bit and my whole life, I've thought of myself like as a business eventually, right. Because of that, you know, just the economic uncertainty. So unfortunately, you know, for my dad, that kind of came in and I, I told my students like, listen, job security is providing a company or multiple companies more value than you cost. And, oh, like and I'm I like, like the rest is all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I was like, listen, um, if you provide more value than you cost, then people are going to be like clamoring for you and your ability to lose a job and go get a job in a relatively short amount of time. That's the confidence. And that's, you know, building up the skill set and realizing like, hey, I can go out there and I can, you know, kill it as an accountant, as an eager student, like I can go out there and, and provide a skill set. And so I didn't, it was kind of something part of what I said, because we did the financial analysis on what my dad should do, right? It, even though it had already happened, I wanted to kind of show them the counter, counteractive, like counterintuitive thinking, because like some people would have said, oh, we should keep the job. And I'm like, then he's paying the company like 90% of his salary to stay there. Whereas like they're essentially giving him free money to leave and he could walk across the street and get a similar job. Like, yeah. You know, and so it's, it's that thinking that comes naturally to us now that we've been in the environment for a little bit, but something that kind of the counterintuitive, like narrative thinking. So then over Christmas, um, I think nothing of it, you know, and then I come back and one student, like a half hour before class, like meets me in office hours. And he's like, okay, well, I learned how to take apart a computer and put it back together. And then I'm also going to learn another skill so that I have job security. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Took it very seriously. I like that. Yeah, he did, but he said that like for the first um like few days, he was really like upset. And I, I'm like, okay, like, you know, we talk about audience, we talk about tone, we talk about like our CPA learners who are, you know, on average 24 to you know 74. I need to remember, and this is why I love this podcast, is like, yes, we want to talk open and we want to talk um, you know, seriously, because these are adults and these are people with like amazing, not only potential, but they're doing cool stuff now. But it's also like, okay, instead of giving a problem, also provide some solutions or some examples of solutions, you know, to provide that like path forward. So I learned just as much as, as they learn through our interactions. Oh man, I, I love that. Um, that's such a great question to ask too, because it's, you want job security, but you, I've never tried to truly define it. I've, I think I've, you know, I've backed into it um, by cobbling together all these different streams of income um but such a good exercise to define it and see what it means to you and then try to actually pair that up with your approach to your own career yeah thank you yeah. thank you it's yeah not not straightforward okay yeah. that, that got a little got a little heavy a little quirk so let's, uh, <laughs> let's pull it back up before we talk about uh some fun things i want to just know do you have like an average week or an average day like what it looks like or is like i'm just i'm so curious um yeah I do I think it it's a bit of a feather in the wind at times depending what's going on with my you know various irons that are in the fire um I do with a lot of stuff I read about you know you hear these people who are every day the same morning routine is so impactful and um I try to lean into that a little bit but I'm I just suck at getting out of bed so being that like 6 a.m workout yeah. guy I just like I can't quite get there so I'm more lunch hour workout guy. Um, so that's got to be part of my day, whether it's if I have 10 minutes, there's a 10 minute workout. If I have an hour and a half, then I can do a full on good one. Um, but getting that movement into a day, um, other piece of non-work related is take my dog out for a walk every day. So Caitlin and I 
every single day, although she is literally walking the dog without me right now. Um, but uh, those pieces have to be in that average day. Um, and then making my own food um, rather than ordering in, even if I'm busy, I, I do a lot of ordering in, but part of that routine and feeding myself, there's not only that it's better for you, but it's, it's that break from what I'm doing at my desk all day to just chopping vegetables, cooking. It can be that, that break in your mindset that helps you um, kind of like the example we talked about last time of how you break that day up of like, Oh, I needed 10 minutes to do something else. I'm out, I'm trimming my freaking trees just because it's like, oh, I need it. And my brain needs to do something different. Yeah, um, no, so for, well, we had a previous conversation because I was fortunate enough to interview um, Pat for an award that he won um, for the CPA Western School of Business for being an outstanding facilitator. And I, yeah, I pulled up uh, an example. I, <laughs> sorry, I threw it out of left field. And I was like, ha like, how about you tell the people like what you do during your breaks? And you're, <laughs> you're like, you're like, oh, gosh I'm like yes I want to hear the story I mean you're like okay I'm gonna do this and this and then I'm gonna go outside and like hack a bunch of like branches off of the trees and I'll be back in a half hour and I was like okay <laughs> yeah it's um I get it's it. that that one side to the other side of the brain and it yeah. just whatever it is that you do like I just need to actively do something um and then come back refreshed right um yeah. So that that's always so helpful with my my average day. Um, you know, thanks to COVID and running my own thing, I don't have to commute anymore. But it used to be, I got that out of the way. I live about ten kilometers from downtown Calgary, so I would bicycle commute there and back. So my day was bookended by some good activity, right? Um, but then, so those are all the non-work things that are kind of the non-negotiable pieces that in some combination need to be there every day um but then work-wise it's it's truly i i'm a list maker i've got at the end of every day i'm one of those people who okay what was done today and then order the priorities for the next day and mm -hmm. then that that guides the actual work approach so when i sit down at my desk first thing um sit there with my coffee and look at okay here's here's what i've set out Usually there's about five emails of various things that have come up that interfere with that priority list. But it, if you want to be having all these different clients on the go at the same time, um, even just the exercise of what's important to help, you know, set yourself up for your day. So you feel in charge. So you're not just, you know, reacting to what's coming up through the day. It's, it, it gives you that roadmap to at least uh, try to stay on course and, um, that really helps me ensure I'm not being too inefficient, switching gears between too many different tasks, yeah. too many different clients. Um, and then finding, you know, for being spreadsheet guy, model builder, um, a lot of the time with building models is you need, you need good chunks of time to get into it because it's highly involved and, and technical. Um, so if I'm constantly bouncing around, I'm not going to be efficient with, building my models or any of the other pieces that I, I need to deal with. But, um, and actually quick, perfect example today is, um, so the charity that I, um, I do the finances for, um, it teaches bicycle mechanics to kids and it's a full on bike shop. So woke up this morning to a bunch of messages that broken into yesterday. So, Somebody got through one of our big garage doors, um, mm. they punched a hole in it. And so three people in hoodies, we have them on camera, came in, they managed to find the nicest bikes we have and took off of them. So, um, but that's one wow. of the things that comes up. Yeah. You yeah. guess where that slid in the priorities. So start of the day was uh, <laughs> dealing with that and talking to the team and, and talking to the insurance company, talking to the landlord. And, um, but without that list of, of priorities of what I need to do today, it, it would have become a longer exercise of scrambling and then feeling at the mercy of what's happening versus, okay, I'm in charge. I'm, I'm also looked at at this place as somebody who needs to be organized and be reliable because I am literally the whole finance and accounting department, um, right? Small charity. Um, but yeah, that, that helps guide the, the day and helps me 
helps me react when an emergency does come up because let's face it, almost every day there's some kind of emergency, whether it's big or small. Yeah. And if COVID has taught us, you know, one of many things, it's like plan for the unexpected, like leave yourself some room to be able to react and react well. And from a place of power, like you said, and not react like just pure reaction. Absolutely. You can, you know, we're all going to have emotional reactions in some way, shape or form, but if we can at least temper our emotional reaction with a little bit of reason and logic, if we're organized enough, then ideally, and I like to at least tell myself this, I'm going to make better decisions and I'm going to be a a more reliable um, financial partner for whatever client is that I am serving. Perfect. Completely agree. Hey, Pat, what do you do for fun? Uh, Lots. Yeah, Um, I know. I I promise I'm not always doing spreadsheets. (laughs) You're uh, like, why? Let me open up my spreadsheet and tell you what I do for fun. (laughs) We can tell my list of things I do and tell you. But I, I, um, I played hockey my entire youth, along with baseball, volleyball, a million other sports, Um, and so still play, you know, casual men's league hockey um just to you know go stand around on the ice at least for an hour a week um and then of course drink some beer in the parking lot with my friends after um do you run up mountains or do you just walk up mountains are you a mountain runner I'm more of a mountain walker yeah and a mountain biker biker right I and thanks to hockey I always hated running like you'd go for training they'd make you go run all summer and run before and after practice and you name it and I just like I don't know. Running, not my favorite thing. I'll do it if I have to, but I agree. I'm like, what are you running from? Where, like, where are the monsters? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so I, I get you. just to get back to the same spot, that doesn't seem right. Well, I'm always <laughs> like, what if I run too far? Like, how do you get back? Yeah, I'm <laughs> stranded. Um, and I, I used to run with the dog a little bit when she yeah. was younger because she just was endless energy. Now she's eight, so she doesn't need to be running all the time. So, um, but yeah, the, so, you know, I play a lot of hockey and I, I do a lot of cycling. Um, the distances for cycling keep getting longer as I get nerdier about it. Um, I'm not quite a road bike in spandex suit type of person, but um, I have a trip uh, that is coming up way too fast now. Uh, I will be in the back country in um, Southwest Alberta for three or four days uh trying to bike 250 kilometers with a full camping setup with me so um I do that for fun people think it sounds awful uh awesome I I love it it's such a good challenge um I'm a bit of a limit pusher anyways and in my personality and it's a it's a really great way to push the limits on myself in terms of you know physical capability um and then you layer on having to camp every night feed yourself do all these like you know things that are that are tough and um yeah. I call that fun <laughs> uh, I I'm just I'm like kudos uh does beer make it into the the mountain the pack or or no because it's like hard because you have to carry uh, it yeah so you, you've got to be so mindful of weight um usually you know last year I did a a multi-day hike with some friends and we all brought one can of beer for the first day so you could you know, have that one tasty beer and then you're not carrying all the weight. Usually you bring a little bit of whiskey, um, but even that gets heavy. So, and, and you bring too much whiskey, it's going to make the next day a little bit painful. So, um, you know, just enough to, just enough to have a nice sip of something good at, uh, at the end of a hard day. Oh man. I love it. Goals, trade-offs, like the analytical <laughs> side of me is I'm like, I'm loving this. Hey, uh, when, before we got on the call, uh, sorry, when, before we started recording, um, and I apologize, uh, are you good to go for a little bit longer? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, I say that because I had to get a new microphone. Uh, so we are sitting here with our brand new, brand new microphone. Anyways. Oh, um, yeah. I'm like nice and fancy. I can see it's like break tech right before. So we're logging on and we're doing our thing. And I noticed for the first time in my life that Pat has tattoos and I just I like I think it's such a badass and I, I like every this is what I love is like I perhaps I get a little bit I don't know I can get some flack for crossing boundaries or like having having friends and like working with my friends or working with people and then considering them friends or like having friendly relationships but 
like, I just love when you get to know people from one reason or another, and you get to know little bits about them more and more and more. And like with you, it's like, and like same with Caitlin, it's, a, it's an onion, right? So I love the tattoos. Of course, I have to point about so that my, I'm um, a but which one was the first one? Um, so there's one I can't quite show you because okay. it's on my back. Yeah. There's a family crest on the top of my back. Um, and I got that when I was 20 because nice. I, I thought, oh, if I get a tattoo, it has to mean something to me forever, which it does. Um, but as, as time's gone on, I've gotten more. The rest of them are all on this arm. Um, but it's not that I'll just get anything tattooed, but I've, my perspective on tattoos is that um, maybe you're not going to love it forever, but it's indicative of where you were at at a given point in your life. Um, so that's led to me being a lot more casual about getting more because I'm so comfortable with these. This means something to me now. Um, I'm comfortable with it being on my body and it's my body. So I can, I can do what I want with it. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I love it. And that's kind of like for careers, for anything, we make the best decisions with the information that we have available and then F it. Yes. Because indecision is also a decision. Um, and is that what you want representing you as somebody that it refuses to make a decision and put a line in the sand. So like, love it, love, love, love it. I, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, uh, and it, it's at the point now where, um, every time I leave, uh, my tattoo artist studio, I seem to have another appointment book. <laughs> Yeah, they're uh, like, see you next month, Pat. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny because it kind of mimics uh, my career where if I look far enough forward, I don't know where I'm getting paid from, which, you know, which deal we're going to have going, um, which clients are going to need projects. Um, but I'm comfortable with that uncertainty. Same thing. It's, I'm going to get a tattoo later. I'm comfortable with the uncertainty of, of what it may be. Even, you know, I don't know what it is at the time, but. Uh, yeah, enjoy the it, ride. Enjoy the ride and keep challenging yourself and good things will happen. Good, good things happen to good people. Um, so within that, uh, do you have any like future plans or options that you're considering uh, in, in general or like where I feel like I feel like the answer has to be no, but I don't know. <laughs> like I'm like, there's too much. Uh, like, <laughs> well, like concrete, like specifically, I have to do this. There's there's not as much, but there's that that framework right those yeah. boundaries of how I approach things and um so it all it all kind of flows back into just those those check-ins that you do with yourself periodically of what are my goals um am I still pointed in the right direction are those goals changing um I do a kind of nerdy but pretty much annually take a look at it of and it's again I I treat myself as if I'm a business so I've got I've got a mission, vision, values that are always morphing in some way, shape, or form, but it's more about the exercise of checking in with them um, to see what what and where I want to be doing things. So, um, you know, of course, there's there's a lot of travel that Caitlin and I love doing, so there's going to be more of that. Um, we're currently thinking about the next one. Um, we just did a five-week trip in the spring here to Scandinavia, um and we've been looking forward to that one for about two years because we originally would have liked to do it in 2020 but of course the world had other plans with COVID um so more travel and 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 that kind of fits within those boundaries I have of well how do I make sure that's doable um so having having good clients who understand me and my working style and making sure I deliver high quality advice and products to them um when I am serving them uh and then building those relationships where there's the trust of, oh, Pat's eight time zones away, but I can still email him and he's still he's still around um, to do what he does from wherever he may be. Um, so that all dovetails into keep growing the firm I work with, keep growing my handful of other clients. And um, yeah, and then more, more crazy bike trips for sure. Uh, I keep dreaming of longer and longer rides. So yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully if, if this one goes well this summer, then uh, I'll probably try something that's uh, measured in, in weeks rather than days next time. So, um, so we'll, so we'll see. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Hey, uh, I'm not sure if I know the answer to this one, but do you uh -huh. at all regret completing your CPA? Because a lot of our students are maybe thinking, 
well, I don't want to do accounting forever or, you know, it's a, it's a pretty long, you know, it's two or two and a half, three years of an investment in my time. I don't know if I want to do it. Like, are there any regrets at all that you have with doing your, your CA or CPA now? No, um, there's definitely when you're going through the articling program and, um, you know, working at the firm when you're young, especially it's felt like there was an opportunity cost to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get a little FOMO because your friends have also graduated or have been working and you're like, oh man, I'm putting all these hours in. It's hard. It's, it's studying, a I'm working. People are having yeah. fun. I'm not. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm at my desk at 10 PM doing my assignment for the week and all my friends are at, you know, flames game or you name it. Like they're just doing something more fun than that. But it was such a worthwhile investment um, of time and energy and, and what you get out of it in terms of not only technical skill set, but um, the ability to deal with, you know, rapidly shifting priorities, um, dynamic environments, just challenges as they come up and being able to look them in the eye and well, like, oh, this doesn't seem that hard given all the other things that I've, I've gone through learning here. So, um, and it's, it's truly now being somebody who works more on the finance side um, and has to build trust um, with my clients relatively quickly to either help get deals done or just my other clients who are looking to me as that um, kind of director of accounting, director of finance role. Um, it obviously you have to back it up, but when they see, oh, you're you're a designated accountant, you must know, <laughs> you must know at least a little about a lot of things. And um, yeah, it's, and the, the number of people who I'm meeting now through my finance clients who say like, um, finding people who have um, the accounting background is actually very sought after on the finance side, um, mm -hmm. because they know you understand the nuts and bolts. Um, so that whatever you're working on, whether it's, you know, M&A or debt raises, equity raises, just general corporate advisory, um, you've got that, that foundation that um, is very relevant and very helpful in, in advising in all those areas. Couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. You gave us some advice a little bit a while back um, for current Dell accounting majors or management majors about dealing with uncertainty. Um, just because we do have a few questions left, but I know where we are kind of running to the half hour. Uh, do you have like just broadly speaking, uh, and this could be, hey, read this book or listen to this podcast, but do you have any other advice for th uh, third or fourth year accounting majors or management majors in general? Um, yeah, I guess like, you know, as far as books go, um, read anything by Douglas Adams. Um, he doesn't have a lot of books, but the ones he does are fantastic. If you've ever heard of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't watch the movie, read the book. It's about a million pages long, but it's totally worth it. Um, but the reason for this that it's, I think it's so great is um, he is so witty and intelligent, but he is not taking anything too seriously. Um, so you've there's a million quotes out there that you've probably heard um that you don't realize are douglas adams but um that's the other side of it is just remember if you're third fourth year student you're going into your career yes take it seriously but also remember this is not life or death sometimes um you know especially going through cpasby program i get emails from candidates who are you know the stress level is so high um just remember that um you know, there's a little bit more to life than just this accounting stuff we're doing and being able to maintain that balance and um, just remember that approach. Um, you're going to be stronger and better off um, with balance rather than letting the whole process freak you out. Yeah. And letting that emotion take over. Hey, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to share it, but I'm going to ask you first, give you time to think and then share my own story. Um, but are you willing to give an example of some time like early on in your career where you messed up and it felt like a big deal in the moment, but now it's something that you're willing to share and learn from? I know it's a little bit out there. So the answer might be no, but I'll share mine. Okay. I flew to the wrong city <laughs> in the U.S. 
as a consultant. Um, and six months later, I was promoted to CFO of a public company. But in the moment, I thought, oh my goodness, there's a bunch of excuses and reasons and blah, blah, blah. But like, could I have made another phone call, written another email and triple quadruple checked instead of landing into a city and then having our 10 missed calls from our admin saying, oh no, you have to come back. And then having to come back into Canada and feeling like the biggest idiot ever and crying my eyes out and thinking there's no way I'm going to be like, just, I'm such an idiot. Um, I can't recover from this. Like, you know, it happens. And I, I owned yeah. it. I took responsibility and I paid for the plane tickets and I didn't charge for, like, I, I made up the time on my own. And I just, I just, I took, I took it, um, but like, I felt like the biggest failure for that 48 hours. And then for like, I didn't talk, it was like five years. Like nobody could talk to me for, about it for five years. And then I realized, <laughs> you know what? That was probably one of the worst things that at that time could have happened to me, but really in the big scheme of things, it's not. And it's something you can like laugh and learn about. And I bring it up when students, when I'm like, Hey, you think that's bad? I flew to the wrong city, like beat that. So can, can you beat that? <laughs> Oh man, I'm I'm trying because I <laughs> I know I know all I did was make mistakes at the start of my career. Right? I still yeah. make mistakes all the time. Yeah. Right? Um, so I don't know the some of the ones that come to mind. Do you remember bank confirmations when you yes. were like early on? And I'm sure it's all electronic now. But when I was a little junior, it was still, hey, sit here and fold a million bank confirmations, um, and I would say like, and some clients we had would have hundreds of bank accounts, right? Yeah. Um, and you'd just be like, oh man, we got to get all of these sent out. And undoubtedly there'd be ones where you didn't check because there's so many either you got the wrong address or you got the wrong person. Yeah. And it just, it becomes this ongoing thing of like, where's the bank confirmations? I don't know. They're not coming back. I don't know why. And so it that's what comes to mind for sure is early experience of like, hey, Pat, we we don't have most of these. And it's like, call them and see who it should go to. And it's like, oh, I didn't do that the first time because <laughs> I just wanted to. Yeah. Maybe I'd send them to the bank and they'd sort it out. It's like, they're not going to hold your hand. You, <laughs> you've got to get it to the right person. Well, um, we laugh now, but like, that's because we have, we've been through it, right? It's completely yeah. understandable. Like, I get it. I get 21 year old or 22 year old Pat. Like, yeah, just send it and it'll get there. <laughs> it'll get there. Someone will, someone will figure out the nuts and bolts for me. Working yeah. industry, we used to get the like AR confirms and be like, <laughs> oh, like, yeah, <laughs> straight into the shredder. And now and then I started working at a firm and I was like, oh, we're going to have some bad karma on here. <laughs> like, this is, yeah. this is good to know. <laughs> <laughs> bad confirmation karma yeah <laughs> no yeah I, I get it like the things that are so obvious to us now and like I call it growth like if I look at the work product I do even now like or even the courses I teach like um I want it to always be like a little bit better a little bit better like or you know ask different questions get better answers or come at it with a different perspective or you know just always be learning and growing versus thinking oh I am now the expert at x right because that's what I feel like you know, when you don't double check or don't ask the questions or don't learn and grow from things, that that's when things repeat themselves. And that would be even worse. Yeah. When you make the same mistakes repeatedly, um, yeah. that's where people definitely start to lose patience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So this is the question that I like um, to ask everyone, because I think it can be something so unique to different people. Or there could be some common themes throughout. So Pat Lennox, what is your definition of success? So I like this one because it's as far as those check-ins I do with myself, this is one of those ones that it changes all the time, right? Um, and not, not like every day it's different, but different points in time is, oh, success to me right now is maybe a little different than it was um, before. So um basically to me there's I'm always kind of focusing on um my friends talk about like the five f's sometimes I don't know if you ever heard that it's like it's like you can have you and you can only pick a few of them and it's like fitness family friends fun and in the moment I've actually forgotten the fifth one but it's right um you want to you want to the point is you want to pick these individual things to focus on so you can't focus on absolutely everything so um so I try to make sure that um 
if I'm being faith, successful, spirituality, spirituality, is it like faith? Is that the another F faith. like just like thinking about like calmness and peacefulness? I don't yeah. Know. I think um, it is. Like whatever, whatever that yeah. means to an individual is like just making sure. Anyways. Yeah. Um, totally. So really it boils down to basically like if I'm going to be successful right now in what I'm doing, um, a lot of it is just checking in on those things that matter. So making sure, um, you know, finances being career and everything. So good cash flow to support my life. And, um, and I like winning in my work. I kind of, I get joy out of that. So yeah, uh, getting, getting wins on projects and on deals. Um, but then coupled with that is flexibility and, and autonomy, right? Because that um, being able to just have that and maintain that helps support a healthier, happier life. Um, so truly right now, I think that's it really. It's, um, it's, it's good lifestyle and good cash flow, And that, that makes me feel successful and, and like I'm achieving what I'm going out to achieve. I love it. When I was an undergrad, I thought the answer was more like, I thought it was just more money or, um, you know, like that's, you know, you got the job title and that came with money. I, like, I didn't even know how much or what that would provide. Like, I just thought it was more. Um, and it took me a long time. And one of the reasons why I host this is kind of showing people what I wish I would have had access to is honest conversations about people saying what their definition was. So I could kind of say, oh, that, that jives with me right now, or that's something I aspire to have in my life versus, you know, more money or more like a higher job title, not really understanding what a, the trade-off was, or B like what, what was more like, was more $40,000 a year? Was it 44? Was it 444? Like I had no idea. I just thought it was the next thing. Yeah. And yeah. And like, great point, right? The, the, oh, more is success. It's like, well, no, not necessarily. Not, not Maybe necessarily. for some of us. Right. But, um, it's so much, there's so much more out there, so much more variety to focus on in life. Um, you can be successful in so many ways without attaching a dollar sign to any of it. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And autonomy. Cause if you're spend 24, seven, 365 working, like, but can't spend any of it, you know, that may or may not match somebody's definition of success. All right, Pat. Uh, so any final comments, anything to add? And can people reach out to you if they have any questions or follow-up that they want to say, Hey, Pat, uh, I want your input on something, or I want to say hello, or, you know, want to see your tattoo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe not the last one, but the first two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Like um, I always love connecting and just uh, like we were talking about relationships at, at the start of the podcast where um, you never know what that conversation or that quick connection might turn into. So um, I'm always happy to connect with, especially, um, you know, people coming out of university, going into the, into the PEP program, um, it's it's always nice to be able to provide a little bit of coaching where I can and just um, yeah see what see what people are planning for and what this next kind of generation, so to speak, of of future accountants is is um, pursuing. And you never know where maybe their mindset is something that on our side we can learn from as well because the world's constantly changing and the fresh ideas coming out of post-secondary institutions and fresh perspectives. Um, probably good to listen to. So a um, little, little back and forth, I think is, is great. So um, yeah, to, to shorten my answer, but yes, absolutely. Uh, anybody who wants to connect with me, I'm more than happy to. Awesome. Would uh, LinkedIn or should I grab an email from you after this? Uh, LinkedIn is, is best. Um, yeah, perfect. I'm on well, there we'll link to it. for my business a lot anyway. So, um, if you, if you look for me on LinkedIn, uh, I will absolutely see it and, uh, and be in response. Pat, thank you. You were so generous with your time. You were so generous with your answers. Um, and just, you've been such, uh, an awesome person to get to know, to work with and to just stay in touch with. So thank you for doing this. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sam. I always love hanging out because we not only are we colleagues in multiple ways, but we're friends too. So um, always a good, just a good excuse to hang out and catch up and talk about interesting things. And um, and then you make me feel important because I, I get to yammer on about myself for an hour or more. So you get to I share. appreciate it. <laughs>
share and sharing is caring. Alrighty. Cheers. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sam.